All right, last week we talked about John the Baptist explaining to the Pharisees why he had come, what he was doing there. Let's read more about him and his important work in preparing the way for the Lord and his ministry. We're going to begin at verse 29. We'll read through verse 34. All right, and it says, The next day John sees Jesus coming unto him and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is before me, for he was before me, and I knew him not. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Unto whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So the Baptist had just last week expressed to the Pharisees why he was there and that there was somebody who was coming after him whose shoes he was not even worthy to tie. And verse 29, going back to our text for today, it says, The next day John sees Jesus coming to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God. John the Baptist could have said, Behold Emmanuel. He could have said, Behold God in the flesh. Behold our good example, uh, the Messiah, the miracle worker, the prophet, the mediator between God and man, all things applicable to Jesus. But there they were out in the middle of the desert Surrounded, apparently, from the other Gospels by a lot of Jews who had come from a lot of places to, to, to follow John the Baptist. And each of them bearing 100 and, I mean, 1,500 years, plus or minus, a history of killing lambs. They had shed the blood of lambs for a long, long time long time and in walks or up walks Jesus and Jesus says behold the Lamb of God it, it sounds barbaric in a way doesn't it taking a little white woolly lamb and slitting its throat really why why take a little innocent lamb for all those years and kill it as a means to shed its blood for atonement for sin through the sacrifice of their lives. All right, let me repeat this. As a means to shed its blood for atonement for sin through the sacrifice of the animal's life. Okay, one of the Bible's central messages is a word called atonement. You've heard of that, the atonement of Jesus Christ. And atonement is only part of what Jesus did on the cross. I'm not going to get into uh, uh, everything else, but we'll just talk about atonement for a minute. All the way in Genesis through Revelation, there is an idea of atonement that is constantly being represented, and that is God seeks to reconcile the human race to himself. Because of the fall, human race completely separated from holy God. Fallen man, holy God. Fallen man, holy God. Human race, God wanting there to be a reconciliation between the two. All right? And um, we call that, that reconciliation atonement throughout the Old Testament. Uh, and a couple times, or once in the New Testament... But it's a made-up word. It's a, it's a made-up English word, actually. And it's the only English theological term that makes its way into the Bible of English origin. Uh, even Easter, which made its way into the Bible, unfortunately, in Acts, uh, being a made-up word, is not English. But 
Atonement is a word from our language that made its way into the Bible. They think it was probably created by Tyndale, who was an early uh, Bible translator. The Hebrew word for, that we use for atonement is kippur. Now you've probably heard of Yom Kippur. That is the Day of Atonement, Feast of Atonement, Day of Atonement, and, and Kippur is, is simply means atonement in the English, all right? But the Hebrew word for atonement is Kippur. And the Greek word is katalaj. So we have two different words from the Hebrew and Greek, and Tyndale's reading them, and he's saying, we don't really have a word in the English language that explains completely what Kippur me meant to the Jews and what kalaj, katalaj means in the Greek. And so he looked around for a term and I guess reconciliation either didn't occur to him or maybe the word wasn't around when he was doing it or it didn't suffice in his mind. So he took an old English word. It's A-T-O-N-E-E-N, atonin. That's an old English word. And if you look at that word, A-T-O-N-E-E-N, you see one in that word. And it's the old English way of saying one. So, oh, you have a tone and apple. That's how they would have said it in the old English. It's one. And so he took that word a tone in and he, he added meant to it. And he literally used like a play on words at one meant. That was from Tyndale to come up with this word atonement. It's interesting, just as a side note, the Book of Mormon uses the Tyndale word as if it came from uh, ancient civilization here and it was a Tyndale word that he made up. So, whatever. Uh, so, we find it all through the Old Testament. We find it once in Romans chapter 5, verse 11. Most modern uh, New Testament translations that many of you might use we'll use the word reconciliation in place of atonement, to reconcile the fallen world to holy God. Now, uh, the most frequently applied meaning of the word atonement in the Bible means blood sacrifice. And um, a blood sacrifice, an atonement was made for the Jews for everything from a heinous crime to uh, like idolatry, which was the worst crime, really, idolatry in the Old Testament, uh, to mere mistakes. In many cases, a lamb was used. Now, listen, we today make a big deal between lambs and goats, probably because in Matthew 24, Jesus, he says, I will stand and I will take the sheep and the goats and I will separate them and the sheep will go one place and the goats are going to go to another. The sheep are his, the goats are not. We see in Satan worship the face of the goat. And to us, the goat is, is a heinous thing. But in the Old Testament, a lamb could have either been a sheep or a goat. When it said lamb, either could have been sacrificed for, uh, for sin as an atonement. Uh, to the Chinese, uh, uh, when they said lamb, it could mean a little tiny goat or it could mean a little tiny sheep. Either one was a lamb, and so it was with the Jews. Let me prove this to you, if you want, in Exodus, when the Lord is instituting the Passover. This is when Moses and the children of Israel are in Egypt. All kinds of plagues have been poured out upon uh, the, uh, the Egyptians, and God says, okay, I'm going to do one more. And this one, the, the spirit of death is going to pass over, and it is going to take the life of every firstborn son. And the way you will be protected by that is through this. And this is what he says. Moses, in Exodus 12, verses 3 through 6, speak unto the con all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Okay, one lamb, one house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So it was, if your house is really small and you're going to take a, a lamb and sacrifice it, 
Invite your neighbor to come over to make sure nothing's wasted here. Don't just kill a bunch of them. Make sure that the house is full enough where the whole lamb can be consumed. He says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Did you know that? We don't know that. We, we, we think, but that's the Old Testament. And you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, with John the Baptist calling Jesus the Lamb of God, we today would never depict this as anything but a little white sheep because we, that's how we want it to be that clean and clear. Uh, but I think it's significant that the sacrifice could have been a little white lamb or a goat, you see, because goats are known to have, when they grow up, and sheep to have a bit of a different temperament. And Jesus was all God, but he was also all man. And I think that there's something to the fact that it could have been either typifying his God in flesh, typifying that he experienced all temptation. He had the desires of a goat in him. He just did not succumb to them by virtue of the lamb that overwhelmed that goat nature, so to speak. So uh, a fact that God alone would never shed his blood, but God becoming man could tells us something about that. And in addition to the fact that they could take either a lamb unblemished from either the little sheep or the little goats, we also note that God has the, has the little animal live in the house for four days with the family. He says, bring it in and let it live among you. And you can't help but know that children will make a good friend of that animal as it's living among them. And they will learn to love that animal and take care of it and, and nurture it and play with it. And then all of a sudden, it's taken from them and it is sacrificed. What a message that's sending to these, to these children. What did God command them to do once it's lived with them in the house for four days? Take its life. Now, could they kill it in any manner that they wanted? No. They had to kill it mercifully, and which means as quickly and without any infliction of pain or the least amount as possible. And from this commandment, God uh, to the children of Israel established the kosher laws, which... Uh, means an animal that is deemed kosher is killed in a very specific manner. The tools have to be extremely sharp. And they draw the, the knife across the neck of the animal in a place where the animal doesn't even feel it. They say that truly uh, animals killed the kosher way will stand there after the throat has been slit and not realize they're dying until the blood starts draining out. And then, then boom, that the, the knife is so sharp and up to the specifications if it's done right. And where nothing is apparently felt. Why kill it though? I mean, what is this barbaric notion of shedding blood? Why blood? What? I mean, this sounds so pagan for God to say, this is what I want you to do to make reconciliation between your fallen nature in this world and me. In Exodus that we just read, the Lord gives further instruction for the Passover. And he says in verse 7, and you shall take the blood and strike it on the two doorposts, okay? And above, on the upper doorpost of the house, wherein shall you eat this lamb? And so he says, put it on a covering. It's a covering. If you look at the, uh, uh, this is a side note, but if you look at the ark where Noah uh, covered the interior with pitch, the Hebrew word for that pitch is atonement. It is uh, uh, Kippur, and it means to cover the interior so that the deluge could not get in and wipe out the interior of that ark. Well, we have the same thing with the doorposts. Here the blood now is the, so that the spirit of death will not come in and take the firstborn son. So, and then verse 8 it says, And then you shall eat in that night roasted with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs, you shall then eat this lamb that you have killed. It's not just the blood that you're shedding and taking its life. The family's, family or family are to gather around and consume the content, not completely, not the bones, not the inwards, the, the edible parts of the animal. 
So we know that when the Jews complied to these specific commands, the spirit of death that God sent to take the firstborn of each Egyptian son would pass over their household because it was protected by the shed blood of the innocent little animal. It's also significant that God does not just tell the children of Israel to shed the animal's blood and to put it on the doorpost, but to eat, ingest, and bring inside themselves that animal for which it gave their life. And that, then that, that animal's life, the blood not only uh, protects it from death, but the, the, the nourishment that the individual families get from eating and consuming that animal. And a practice that we commemorate when? When we take communion, we ingest him and bring him in and it's all spiritual, but there's a physical element to it too, that we too, the blood covers us and we ingest him as the same typification that we have in the Old Testament, we have there in the new in the sacrifice of Christ. Okay, pretty amazing. But why the shedding of blood? This used to plague me. Hebrews 9.22 gives us partial answer. It says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission of sin. It's got to be the shedding of blood for there to be a remission or a covering of a reconciliation from the sin. So blood is important in making atonement between holy God, the shedding of blood, and fallen sinful man, the shedding of blood. But from this alone, we don't really have any idea of why the blood must be shed, what it actually does in God's eyes. Going to the Old Testament where we're given further insight that's going to help bring this all together, and it's found in Leviticus 17. If this is what it says, Leviticus 17, 11. Listen, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it unto you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. The first line's important. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. It says way back in Leviticus. Between human beings, the law demanded that if you knock out a tooth, you give a tooth. If you take somebody's sight, you give your sight. And not very comfortable, but fair, equitable. Steal an apple, give an apple. Blind a man, expect yourself to be blinded. Not fun, um, equitable, very impractical to a healthy society though. Uh, we would all walk around if we were living by that truly and be a bunch of maimed people, wouldn't we? So it's not real applicable to a healthy society, this equitable justice between each other. But that's how it was. If you do this, if you take a life, your life is taken. It's life for life, tooth for tooth, eye for eye, apple for apple. That's God's way in the Old Testament of saying this is justice. This is how we're going to do it, all right? But listen, between holy God and fallen men, justice for any sin that we have done against him, which is every sin, the only way to make reconciliation is going to be life for sin, nothing else. It has to be life for sin is the exchange, eye for eye, tooth for tooth between us. But when it comes to reconciliation with God, it has to be life for sin. We've sinned against him. What can we offer to him that's going to make up for it in, in the reconciliation? It has to be the shedding of blood, the life force that he gave us, okay? Stay with me. If we sin against God, how can eye for eye, tooth for tooth do it? Nothing but the shedding of life can do it. Frankly, this taking of an animal's life was not a perfect reconciliation. When they killed the, uh, the animals and the blood was shed, it only temporarily said, okay, I'm go God says, okay, uh, you're, you're in your sin. You've, made the, you've done what I've told you to do. I don't like this system. We're doing it because it is a picture of what's to come. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 10.4. 
for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. All it did was cover it and made a temporary covering where God would say, okay, you've sacrificed something important to you, an animal that was very important to you, and that lived in your home or whatever you did, you've sacrificed it, you've, you've given life for that, but that is not gonna do it. That's merely gonna cover, okay? Up until the sacrifice of God in the flesh, the Lamb of God, the blood served only to temporarily cover sin, uh, distributed to kind of appease holy God until he came. In fact, we also read in Hebrews that in the sacrifice of sheep and goats, it says God had no pleasure. He had no pleasure in the sacrifice of sheep and goats. Okay, so if you think that God uh, was, they were sacrificing these animals and God had pleasure in it and liked it, he didn't at all. But we're talking about perfect reconciliation and it is by the life blood shed into which that could occur, okay? So we have the fact that when it comes to sinful man, the only means to reconcile him or her to holy God is the giving of life, which in human beings, according to Leviticus, is the shedding of blood. Now we know why. It has to be a life that is, it is given for sin. God gave us this life. God is life, holy life. If we were to really look at it, the opposite of God's life given would be sin. It would be the antithesis to living. People think, well, I really lived it up today. I just went and did this and I did that. That's not living it up the way God says. That's, that's, the, that's the road to death. That's the opposite of the life he gave. So, you know, the world today, we think living it up means, you know, all those things that the world does. But God says, no, 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 no. It's sin that actually leads to death. And you, with your life, have said, I'm going to choose to sin. I'm going to choose to go toward death. Therefore, life is going to be taken. He dwells in light and love, and there is no shadow within him. He gives life. With sin, the antithesis to life is given, and the only true justice for it being squandered, for life being squandered on our part, is the taking of life, of a perfect life. It's just not the loss of any life. Uh, we can't shed our own blood. It is an insufficient sacrifice, as insufficient of a sacrifice as that of an animal. It's not going to accomplish anything because we're, we're probably worse than an animal because we have blemishes. And those animals at least were, you know, young and, and innocent and, and, and since no blemish, etc. So another perfect blood had to be spilt for sin. And then we come to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world he gave, just like the, the children of Israel gave their animals up, gave, God gave the, his lamb up. He gave his lamb for the sins of the world and they could be reconciled. So John the Baptist sent from the womb to be one crying in the wilderness and preparing for the Messiah, sees the Lord walking toward him in John's account and he says, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The perfect Lamb took away sins of just a few, the world. He took away all of it, reconciled the entire world to God. We know that from scripture. All paid, perfect reconciliation, once and for all. So where God had no pleasure in the sacrifice, as Hebrews says, of animals, little animals, he didn't like it at all, he gave his son because it was the only way to reconcile this fallen place with him. And that reconciliation was a reconciliation of sin past in your individual lives, sin present, sin future, and that sin is worldwide, universally reconciled by him on the cross. Only one sin remains unforgivable to this world. It's a sin which we blaspheme against God who is calling to all men and women and saying, I've provided a solution for you. Here it is. I, he calls. He calls through nature. He calls through a bunch of different ways. He calls on our conscience. He's saying, I have given it. Do you believe it? And God, Jesus says, the unforgivable sin in this world or in the world to come is unbelief. You don't believe it unforgivable in this world, the world to come. Because the sin has been taken care of. 
But Jesus says there is one that remains, a sin of unbelief in the work I've done. Okay? Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which simply means not believing in the gift that God gave. Now remember two things about John's narrative. First, he writes it to fill in the gaps that are not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John came along many years later and he read those, I'm, I'm assuming, or the Holy Spirit did. And John then said, okay, I'm gonna cover things that weren't covered. We know that about it. We also know that his narrative is more like watching a movie where it begins with uh, some foreshadowing or flashbacks and then jumps to the present and goes back to that. So we see that right here. Okay, let me explain. What we have here in John's account is the next day John sees Jesus coming toward him and says, behold the Lamb of God. And it seems in our reading of it that this is the first time he's seen Jesus, but that couldn't be so. Let me explain. Um, the only way for us to see and understand it is let me reread our passages for today. Listen closely. It says, the next day John sees Jesus coming to him and says, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. So at that point, verse 29, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Messiah, the Lamb of God, okay? Then John says, that the Baptist says, this is him of whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now look at verse 31. And I knew him not. I didn't know who he was. Who was this Messiah? In verse 31, he says, I don't know. But that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore I am come baptizing with water. So John says, I came baptizing with water so I could identify who this Messiah is. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending uh, from heaven like a dove, and it bowed upon him. It's verse 33, and I knew him not. But he that sent me, God, to baptize with water... The same said to me, upon whom thou shalt see the Holy Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And so we could again say here, the next day John sees him coming. What I mean by that is John, in, at verse 29, he had already baptized Jesus. The Holy Spirit had already fallen. And that is how he was able to say at verse 29, behold the Lamb of God. There's no other way we could read that. So we see that John, the beloved, the writer, skipped the baptism altogether here. He didn't include baptism in his narrative because it was included in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right? By the fact that the Holy Spirit fell on the Lord when, Je uh, when John baptized him, that's how he was able to identify him as the Lamb of God. See, God had told John, which is not recorded somewhere in his desert sojourn, this is the time for you to go. You're gonna baptize somebody. When you baptize that person and the Holy Spirit falls and remains on him, you're gonna be able to identify that one as the Messiah and you're gonna be able to pronounce him as that who he was. This is why the beloved, uh, John the Beloved quotes John the Baptist as saying in 33, I didn't know who he was. But when God sent me to baptize him with water, he said, upon who you'll see the Spirit descending and I bear record and saw that this is the Son of God. You get that? So this is just one reason that Jesus was baptized. So that John the Baptist could see the Holy Spirit descending, rest upon him, and John the Baptist could fulfill his prophetic ministry and say, this is the Lamb of God. He had a lot of followers, a lot of Jews. It was all set up. They came out to find him and see him, and he's baptizing them, pre preparing them to, uh, in repentance to receive the Messiah, and then John baptizes the Messiah. The Holy Spirit falls, and John says, I've seen him now. Behold the Lamb of God, he says. And the Jews look around, and they say, this? This is the Lamb of God you've been talking about? Jesus walks up and there it is. Okay? So, one of the standard arguments that people use who say that Christians must be baptized for salvation is taken from this one. If baptism wasn't necessary for salvation, why was Jesus baptized? Okay? It's a good question. I mean, Jesus didn't need to repent. Jesus didn't need to be born again if you're going to define being born again as being baptized, which some churches do. He didn't need either of those. So what's up with him being baptized by John the Baptist? Well, the first reason we have is so that the Baptist could identify him. 
okay? There's one reason why Jesus was baptized. So when someone comes to you and says, you have to be baptized, well, why do I have to be baptized to enter into the kingdom of God? Because it says so. Well, why else? Well, Jesus was. Well, let me give you some reasons why Jesus was. One, he had to be, because John the Baptist couldn't have identified him unless he was and the Holy Spirit descended, and that's what God told him. You got that there. The second one is it fulfilled prophecy. We covered that last week. Malachi 1.3, where it says that one will come and he will prepare the way for him. So we know it was for that reason. And he came to prepare the, the, the nation of Israel to receive the Messiah. His, listen, his, John's was a baptism of repentance. His was a baptism of repentance. Remember that. Do not ever forget John's was a baptism of repentance. Jesus did not need to repent so that his purpose of being baptized had to have other reasons. We'll talk about that in a second. So the repentance that, the baptism of repentance that John the Baptist was doing was telling the Jews, listen, you have been given the law. You have been given a, a relationship by and through the law by God. Repent and return to it. Get back and change your ways from all these traditions that, you have now, that you're now following. And what method did John the Baptist use to prepare them? It was this water baptism. Why water baptism? Remember who John was dealing with? Jews. A group of people who for a thousand years of washings and ablutions and women had mikvahs and all these washings and washings and washings. John was given the baptism of repentance to wash them in preparation for the Messiah who was going to come. That was the purpose baptism for John served. The baptism of a Christian does not wash anything from us. Nothing whatsoever. And when religions take that and use that, it's completely errant to a contextual understanding of Scripture. Okay, so this washing that John did, though, was symbolic of cleansing of the sin of the generation of Jews under the law in repentance. They, they were changing their mind in preparation for the Messiah to come. That's all you have to do when you talk about John's baptism. It was just a preparation cleansing for the Messiah to come. Uh, listen. This was told in Ezekiel, this, this washing. Listen to how it's said, too. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. To the Jews, God says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my stat statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. He is talking about this cleansing that John the Baptist would do and then the Holy Spirit moving in into these early Christian believers who were formerly Jews. That is a prophetic utterance for that. All the water and washings were emblematic of the washing away of sin. The washing away of sin by the presence of the Holy Spirit to come. Okay, but the Holy Spirit was not the cleansing. The Holy Spirit would come by and through Christ. And remember what John said to uh, the Jews, I indeed baptized with water unto repentance, but... Remember, so we got that one category. I indeed baptize with water unto repentance. I do this ablution. I do this thing to prepare you. I indeed do that. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not even to uh, latch. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So we have a completely different baptism over here that Jesus is going to do. This was the whole event John was preparing the kingdom of Israel for, the baptism of the Holy Spirit which is the true baptism the Christian needs, okay? You need that baptism of the Holy Spirit. The one of water, yeah, it's a good one. It really is beneficial. It has ties to it, which we're gonna to talk to in about a second. But the baptism you need to enter heaven, like the thief on the cross, had to be reconciled by faith on Christ and on faith on him alone. And by that, you are baptized by his Holy Spirit and with fire. So we have that going on there. Now, these cleansing rituals of water the nation of Israel are so familiar with, this is a second reason Jesus was baptized. They were especially binding on the nation of Israel's priests, okay? You see, way 
in the law of Moses, uh, before it was given even, every man, because the wife had her identity to God through her husband, every man was uh, his own priest, okay? Later on, the office of priest of every individual male devolved or evolved to the head of a family. So the man was the priest over his immediate family. And we see that in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then the law of Moses was given and God said, okay, I'm gonna take a special group of men from the tribe of Levi. These guys are gonna be my priests, all right? They are gonna be the ones who do all the things who come from Levi's son, Aaron. But in the end, all these priestly appellations were only temporary and in place and we're looking to a time when there would be one priest, one high priest, and it would not be a priesthood of a nation of men. It would be one man, Hebrews tells us, Jesus Christ. He is the one and only high priest, okay? And so, uh, so when John the Baptist began his prophetic ministry to prepare the way for this one and only high priest, he's calling Israel to repent and he does this baptism that typified what the priests of the Old Testament would go through before they entered the temple. They would be washed and they would be anointed. So Jesus, prior to entering into his ministry as the great and only high priest for the world, he is baptized, washed, and he comes up out of the water. And what happened? The Holy Spirit fell, which was the, whole, the, 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 the anointing the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So he was washed and he was anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the only high priest to mediate between us and God, you see? So there's another reason why John the Baptist baptized Jesus and why Jesus submitted to it. It fulfilled all things. Jesus said to fulfill all righteousness. For centuries, the, the Hebrew priests were get, going through these ablutions and getting clean and doing all this and being anointed with oil, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes along, the final high priest. He's the only high priest. There's no other high priest. It's a mockery for any man to call himself a high priest. Jesus comes in and says, all that is done. That nation of priests, done, 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 done. A woman no longer has her identity through her priestly husband, done. Everybody has to come through me now by their heart. No more circumcision of the flesh. It's circumcision of the heart for every single individual. And this is how he is the high priest now. Okay, all right, add into the fact that we've talked about this, when a Gentile was gonna convert to being a Jew, they were immersed in water, and we have a picture of John's baptism unto repentance and why he was doing that of those people. All those elements present. Now understand, this specific water baptism that John performed, again, nothing to do with the baptism that we embrace when we believe. It was a completely different baptism with a completely different purpose than baptism has for us today. This is entirely missed, at least by the LDS and some other uh, Christian denominations. Let me help explain this to you. You might think of baptism like you think of the word coloring, okay? Just take baptism and think of it as coloring, all right? Now, we could color our hair, which I've never done. Uh, you could color your hair. That's one application of the word coloring. Or you could uh, color a book with your grandson or your child you, or yourself. You could take a coloring book and you color that. You could color an Easter egg, which you're going to go about a process that is similar but very different from coloring your hair and similar to coloring a book but also different. You do a lot of dipping and other things. Baptism is just like the word coloring is to us. It is a word that has a bunch of different methods and applications to it. So when you read the baptism of John, it, in, it's like comparing the coloring of an Easter egg to the coloring of a, of a book. It, they're different, but they're also the same, okay? So the Bible speaks of all sorts of baptisms. There are wet baptisms. We know what those are. There are dry baptisms. Do you know that Paul describes the children of Israel going through the Red Sea on dry ground? He says they walked on dry ground. And as they passed through it, he says they received the baptism of Moses. So they were baptized under that water or by the mists of that water. 
on dry ground by Moses. The baptism of Moses is a completely different baptism from the baptism of John the Baptist, from the baptism of a Christian. All kinds of different ones. There's baptisms of the Spirit. There's baptisms of suffering the, the uh, Bible talks about. I have the baptism of suffering on my life right now. What does that mean? It means I'm identified with suffering in my life. What does that mean? It means things are not going well and the Lord is giving me the identity of being a sufferer. That's its baptism. Nothing to do with some of the other ones. There's baptism of fire, which might be uh, synonymous with suffering. So why Jesus baptized, was baptized by John the Baptist some believe Jesus was baptized to show the world that he had to be baptized because that's the example he needs to set. Maybe there's some reason to that, but it's kind of simplistic. Remember, John's baptism was not the Christian baptism, nor were water baptisms that Jesus' disciples did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, uh, Matthew, Mark, uh, Andrew, John, Peter, James, the baptisms they did had nothing to do with Christian baptism. Did you know that? In fact, our baptism today is completely different from what they were doing because they were doing to the house of Israel. And they were saying, the house of Israel was saying, I, have I, I am going to receive Christ. And they baptized in, in, in light of the fact that they were receiving Christ. And they had changed their mind about the law. Later on in Acts, anybody who was baptized by the apostles or by John was rebaptized. Did you know that? Into the Christian church. It's a completely different identifier when you're baptized as a Christian whether, uh, versus being baptized by one of the apostles. So those earlier baptisms were baptisms unto repentance for the house of Israel, to repent in light of the law and all God had given them as a nation and the promised Messiah that was coming. Listen closely. There was no Christianity when Jesus was on this earth. It did not exist. We have his teachings. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in the first part of Acts up to chapter 10 were extensions of his ministry to the Jews. It's just an extension of the Old Testament. It's Old Testament Malachi, intertestamentary period, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all Old Testament. We don't have the New Testament Christianity come into play until Peter baptizes and the house of Cornelius, who was not a Jew. And then that opens the way to, to all men and women receiving. And now baptism means a completely different thing. And now if you're a woman, you better be, uh, not you better, but you have that opportunity to be obedient, to be baptized, just like your husband. If you don't want it, you don't get it. But you're responsible before God with that, okay? So we have a completely different dispensation there. John's baptism bounded subjects to repentance relative to the law and the Messiah, not to faith in Christ, and being buried with him. And then we're gonna get into now what Christian baptism means. So also to support this, remember John's baptism, to show you that it was just another version of color and coloring, John's baptism, he did it unto repentance. Did he do it in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit? No. His baptism was, I'm baptizing you unto repentance. I'm baptizing you unto repentance. But to Christians after Acts 10, I baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And, from the, and for the Jews from the end of Matthew, uh, end of uh, Christ's dispensation forward. So um, I hope you're starting to get the biblical picture of baptism and John the Baptist's baptism and, and how it is not tied to why we are baptized today. Now there are a number of very important reasons. We've talked about the ordinance of Christ as the high priest, uh, but let me take, go back to that point really quick. What was the identifier for the nation of Israel? Remember, the wives got their identity before God through their husbands then. What was the identifier for a family to be known as a Jew in the Old Testament? The old snippy snippy, right? The old snippy snippy. God says, circumcise yourselves, okay? And, and so it was only to men and they were circumcised and it was an identifier to say, I am a Jew. Okay, so just as Christ as a child was submitted to being circumcised too, was he not a Jew? Yes, he was a Jew. The, he was a Jew of Jews. But the circumcision was merely an identifier to show his association with the house of Israel. All right, and it was necessary that he should submit to that initiatory ordinance of the dispensation of circumcision because that is who he was representing and coming to. 
Now, he's also initiating the dispensation of grace, okay? And what is the uh, identifier for our identif uh, identification as Christians? Do we walk around wearing uh, certain symbols sometimes? But this isn't what makes me a Christian in the sense of other believers. What is it? Circumcision, Old Testament, baptism, new. The Greek word really means to die. That's why we call, I use color in there. And you could, you, you are bringing somebody and you are dying them into a new fabric. That's why baptism is not private. There are people who come and say, I want to be baptized, but I don't want anyone to be there. That's not its purpose. You think that God really cares about you going and being gotten, gotten wet in a river by some guy who just calls himself a pastor or who is a pastor with a PhD? God doesn't give a rat's rear end about that thing. That isn't what makes you a Christian. Baptism going and getting dunked in water does nothing to make you a Christian any more than a pagan going out and taking a rock and circumcising himself made him a Jew. It's something we do because we are a Christian. You see, and we identify and the baptism is so that other Christians can say, ah, that's someone who believes like me. They are willing to stand publicly and say, I believe in Christ. He is my, my God and my King. I'm going to be buried with him. That's the Christian symbol of baptism. I'm going to rise to new life in him now. And every one of you who see it can hold my feet to the fire. So you're all here and I decide to get baptized today and someone comes up and my wife, she could baptize me if I haven't been baptized. You're going to go, what? Look at, we have nothing that says that, that can't happen. We have a great Christian couple here. They didn't know better. They came out of Mormonism from watching the show and they were in Israel on a trip and he hadn't been baptized. His wife said, I'll baptize you. So she baptizes him. We brought that up in a class about two years ago and people went haywire. Ah, they're renting their clothes. A wife baptized. What? It doesn't say that that can't happen. It's not a priesthood anymore. It's believers. And so he, he, in his humble heart, says, baptize me, honey. You're the only one here before these people. So she did. They didn't know otherwise. Did it stick? Of course. But after a teaching on that, the guy went and he got baptized by a man afterward, ticked his wife off to no end. Uh, but in any case, this is what it's for. It's the heart. It's the heart that says, I believe in Jesus. And so I find people in the history of doing ministry Sometimes they'll come up and say, well, I want my baptism to be, you know, just with a few people and, and I want to have this little musical number and I want to have this poem read and I want to have this occur and then maybe we can have it catered by, by Gucci Halamala down the street and then my baptism, I really want my, I just, shut up. When you're ready to be baptized, you humbly walk up, fully clothed. We've seen this in the park. And you're all made up beautiful ladies. I love it when the ladies do it. I've seen this a few times in baptizing. And they come up and they're just tearing, I want to be baptized. And you baptize and they come up like drowned rats. And they're just like, that is the heart that says, I want to be identified with Christ. Okay? And it's the same heart that, that a man would say as a Jew, I want to be identified with Christ through, the, through God, through the nation of Israel. Circumcise it. You know, it's painful, it's embarrassing, it's tough. But that is the thing with baptism. But we've made it such a mode of religion in order to, to try to uh, uh, um, uh, herd cats, which is what you guys are like. So we say you got to be baptized by our, this. now you have our baptism and you're this. And, and there's something to that too, which we'll touch on. But just get it. Just try to understand what it's all about. People ask me, why was Jesus baptized? I say, why was he circumcised? Well, well, he, he was a Jew. Well, he was baptized just to show all these things. And you give the laundry list. He was a king and a priest. And it was the initiation of the grace. And it was so that John could identify him. And it, what, baptism is a good thing. Don't, don't get me wrong here now. I uh, was on television uh, doing our show for the first year. And someone called in. Uh, you probably heard this. I'm sorry. Hey, have you been baptized? I hadn't been. I was like, no. And so that week I went and I got my mentor at Calvary Chapel and he baptized me uh, in uh, the jacuzzi at uh, uh, where we were living in Huntington Beach. And my life changed. I did it from my heart. Had I come and said, first, I want to be baptized and then now I'm going to learn to believe, I wouldn't have meant anything. But as a full believer and then submitting to baptism, it really did bring in spiritual blessings. Okay. So circumcision, best understood as identity, which in and of itself has no power to actually make a person of the house of Israel. Uh, so it is in the Christian economy, the 
the rite of water baptism ought to be seen in the same light as a means to identify ourselves as Christians. Um, So Jesus was baptized for other necessary and important reasons. The book of Hebrews tells us plainly, as I said, he's our high priest. Uh, first water, washed, then Holy Spirit. But he fulfilled the righteous ordinance in his initiation to the office of high priest to then come in and make an offering for the sins of man. You get that? He started his ministry off. His thing was to shed his blood. And so he goes in and the high priest in the Old Testament was washed he was anointed and he shed the blood of a bunch of animals and poured their blood in different places on the, put the tips on this. Jesus came as the lamb of God. He's washed, he's anointed, and then he offers his own. And later on, that was the whole, really the, the main purpose. And then of course, he was baptized to fulfill prophecy. In the Gospel of John, we read the, uh, the, the fulfillment of that Malachi prophecy when jo John says, I didn't know who he was, but God told me to go and baptize him and the Holy Spirit would fall on the Messiah and then I would know who he was. And so when John did that, we saw the fulfillment. Okay. Bottom line, Jesus being baptized, summary point, Nothing to do with being mandatorily baptized for your salvation, as some religions tend to imply. I'm sorry to pick on Mormonism, but as an example, baptism is not only requisite to enter into their celestial kingdom, they consider it tantamount to being born again. They read John 3, which we're going to get to in the next few weeks. And in John 3, Jesus said, marvel not that I say you must be born of water and of the Spirit. And so they say that's what rebirth is, being baptized and then being uh, born again through the Holy Spirit. And we will prove that is not the case whatsoever. So what of water baptism in the Christian dispensation today? Um, the mode of baptism, dipping, sprinkling, immersing, can in no way be determined by the use of the Greek word baptizo in the New Testament. I'm not saying immersion isn't the way or the best way, but I am saying you cannot use the New Testament. You can use some circumstantial evidence from the New Testament to show that immersion is the best way, but the word baptizo in the Greek no way tells us that it has to be by immersion itself. Baptizo means to dip a thing into an element or liquid or to put an element or liquid on the thing, okay? It was an industrial term, as I said, for dyeing fabric, and it really helps us understand the concept of identification. Just like coloring our hair identifies blondes uh, as brunettes once the coloring is over. It's an identification. So the, the, the word has a wide latitude of meaning, and in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, Sprinklings are called baptizo, washings, pourings, dippings. And in the New Testament, there is not one single well-authenticated instance where the word means immersion. Uh, and none of the instances of baptism recorded in the Acts, which are a lot, favors the notion that it was by dipping or immersing, though immersion seems probable. So the reason I say this is because how Paul assigns the meaning of Christian baptism is important. And so this is why I would suggest that immersion is the way. Paul says that it is us being buried with Christ. It's tough to have that symbolism and baptism and what it means to the Christian through any other way. Um, and then being risen to new life. You can't rise out of a sprinkling, really. But I guess maybe you could if you, if you stretch it. The gospel and its elements, however, are designed for all people who come to God by faith. When the Holy Spirit touches them and, and moves in and changes hearts. So if we have somebody in Sudan or a person in the, in the Arctic who wants to be baptized and all you have is a bowl of water to do it, that would suffice. And there would not need to be any other further immersion unless you really believe that was necessary for you and your relationship to God, then you're free to do it. Um, know that baptism is not included in the New Testament definition of the good news. Paul says, I'm glad I didn't baptize, but instead preach the gospel. 
So Paul says baptism separate from the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. However, baptism and the Lord's Supper are two symbolic ordinances Jesus Christ himself gave to those who would be in his church. Communion, we partake of it showing the work of Christ for us. Baptism, we partake of showing the work of Christ being buried with him, but rising by a new spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we have those two ordinances instituted in the church for a good purpose and good meaning. We take communion, remember, because we believe that we have been saved by his shed blood, not to believe and not to become believers. You get that? Do you understand that? We take it because we believe. So it is with baptism. We are baptized because we, we have been saved by his blood, not to be saved by his shed blood. That differentiation might help when you look at why we take communion and why we would then would be baptized. Water baptism is an outward public profession, pronouncement of an inward faith, symbolic that we are willing to be buried with Christ. Your former person is buried with Christ, your flesh, and rises up to now live by the Spirit. Now, I've asked a question before. How do you know when an alcoholic will never take a drink again? When they're dead. When they're dead. That's the only way you'll know that an alcoholic will never take a drink again. You might really think the, the program worked and they haven't drank for 20 years, but there's always that potential. Okay? But when they die, it's impossible for them to take that drink again. So what we are is we are buried in our former man, woman, with Christ at baptism. We are dead under the water. That's why you can't breathe down there. You're dead. And you rise up filled with the Holy Spirit now, even though the Holy Spirit filled you before. It wasn't from the baptism, don't get me wrong. And you're saying, okay, I'm going to walk in new life. The only way to ensure that the former man or woman doesn't rise back up is to keep them buried. And the new life has to take over. So you feed the new life with the Holy Spirit by the word and by all the things we do. And, and the former man stays buried. But when the former man with all his little tricks starts to climb up out of the water again and take control, that is who's in control. And so that's why it's symbolic that Paul gives that we are buried with Christ and rise to new life. Okay? Perhaps the best illustration we'll end with this comes in the book of Acts, and it's actually a passage that people who say salvation is necessary to wash away sins use. And uh, if you want to look at that, look at it. But Peter stands up before a crowd of Jews in Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has fallen on them. They are believers. The Holy Spirit has, has given them new life. They believe the message surrounding Christ, and Peter says to them, listen, repent, remember it was to the Jews, who the Messiah is for them, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And so the religionists say, the Mormons say, certain Baptists say, certain denominations say, you see, right there, be baptized for the remission of your sins. Well, maybe I should be baptized. Now, these Jews came from all over and they believed in the result of their faith, Peter says, now change your minds, all of you, of how you have carried on relative to the Messiah and to the law and be baptized for the remission of sins. The key thing is in the Greek, the word for there. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. In the Greek, listen closely, the Greek word for for is eis, E-I-S. And it's a preposition that can indicate causality. Uh, in order to get something, I am going to drive to the store for bread. That is causality. I'm doing this for the uh, uh, object of gaining bread, okay? Or as a resultant preposition, uh, the result of, the result of, or because of. So for can mean either thing in the Greek, okay? So when Peter says, uh, be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What does it mean? If we read it in the causal prepositional sense, it means re Peter would be saying, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ in order to get a remission of your sins. That would be the, the causal. But if you read it, it, the preposition with resultant, it's repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ because you have received a remission of your sins. And guess what? Which one is it? 
It's the resultant in Acts. So when someone says it's right here, you say they are doing it because the Holy Spirit has fallen on them. Not to get it. Not to be saved, you see. And it clearly states that's how water baptism should be because of a remission of sins. It doesn't get us into heaven. It identifies each other. Uh, it identifies us with each other, which is an entirely different subject. Uh, in this way, we identify ourselves as believers. We receive specific mandates, possibly because we are being baptized in a church with other like-minded believers. Sometimes churches assign things to that baptism, and there is some historical evidence that that's beneficial to a church. Not all agree with this point. <coughs> I could be wrong on it, but it does serve as an identifier for those who have said, Jesus is my Lord and King. I will die with him now symbolically. I'll be raised to new life, and I will follow him. All right, let's stop here. Question.